26, Java. Um, the classes are recorded, uh, which has a nice feature for you. If you miss a class, you can always watch it. Um, and uh, that's about it. Uh, if you ask a question, you're welcome to press the little thing in front of you that looks like, I don't know, a remote control of some kind, car door opener or something. And uh, the camera will go on you and your microphone will go on so that the recording can pick up your question. Um, if you don't do that, I'll probably just repeat the question. All right. Um, let's start with attendance. Jared Adams. Delvante Anderson, Richard Baker, is this the right class? Joseph Sandrowski, all right. Rico Daniels, Michael, Mark Kirshner, Ethan. Was that a yes for Ethan? OK. Uh, I was going to say, because I think Ethan was in my earlier class, and you don't look like him. So Alexander, Samuel Odom, David Ramirez, and Kyle. All right, there we go. Um, I assume that you're all familiar with Canvas. If you are not familiar with Canvas, um, see me, and we'll go over the parts of it that um, you need to know. Um, and uh, what I gotta say, um, you know, the parts we're gonna use for this class. Who uh, who just came in? Okay. Okay. All right. What I plan on doing is going over um, the basics of the class, the syllabus, how the class is going to be structured, and so on. And then we'll get into the actual course material. Um, so that's sort of the plan for today. Um, I'm not going to go over stuff word for word because you can um, you, know, you can easily read it on your own. At the top of the syllabus is a list of different ways of getting a hold of me. Um, Probably the best way, simplest way, to get a hold of me is through Canvas email. Um, you know, Canvas email has the advantage for me that it's isolated from the, the thousands of other emails I get per day. And therefore, if you have a question, it really stands out and I see it. And I try to answer my Canvas email uh, once a day-ish. Uh, but if for whatever reason Canvas is down and you can't get a hold of me, um, you don't have access to a computer, um, whatever, there's other ways to get a hold of me as well, including phoning, uh, regular, uh, my regular uh, email account, and so on. I will have office hours that I will announce. Uh, in addition, uh, you are welcome to come in and sit on any of my other labs. So I have a, a lab earlier in the morning. So if you have questions, you're welcome to come in on that lab. Or if you need extra help, you can come in uh, to one of my Tuesday or Thursday labs as well. So it's sort of an open environment where even though you're not in the class, you're welcome to come to the lab to the class. I, I give that opportunity to people in other classes to come into your lab too if they want to. <clears throat> if my office, I haven't announced my office hours yet, but when I do announce my office hours, if they don't work for you, we can arrange other times. You know, maybe you can only meet on Fridays, and I'm not here on Fridays. Well, we can, we can arrange a, a time on that day. We can communicate via the phone, or we can communicate via Skype. Uh, do let me know before you add me on Skype. Don't simply like wait for me to pop up on Skype and just Skype me in the middle because you know, um, it, it, you know, even even though the technology is available, it should be treated more like an appointment. So let me know uh, if you want to connect via Skype and when you'll be able to do it, and and I should be able to accommodate you if I don't have anything else going on. So the point is that there's a lot of ways 
to get a hold of me. Um, and I make them available to you and I try to be accessible. You can ask me questions during class. You can ask me questions during lab. You can email me questions and so on. The idea here is I want to give you every opportunity to ask the questions that you have in order for you to be successful in this class. Uh, just giving you the opportunity though isn't enough, right? Uh, you need to take advantage of that opportunity if, if, you need, if, if you need the opportunity to get additional questions. So I make the opportunity available. It's on you to connect with me, one of the many ways that I give you to connect with me. Feel free to ask questions in the lecture period. There is what, 10 people in class, give or take? Yeah, about 10 people in class. So it's a small class, you know. Uh, consider that you are 10% of the class, you know. Consider that if you and someone else don't understand something, and they always tell teachers if one person doesn't get it, there's a good chance someone else doesn't get it, that's 20 or maybe even 30% of the class, all right? So by all means, don't hesitate to ask questions if you need to. Worst case scenario, if you ask me a question and maybe it relates to a specific problem that you're having in lab, I'll tell you. Well, let's talk about it during lab, all right? Um, but ask away. There is a whole slew here about the class and the outcomes. Read that on your own and just know that this is sort of our guiding light. This is what we are going to be focused on. You have uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you have had classes here via the LC labs and understand that the labs have software that resets them completely and wipes the hard drive every time that they're rebooted. So you have to take a copy of your code with you. So you can email it to yourself, a thumb drive. I think you have a certain amount of space on Canvas that you can go to upload stuff. The point is, is you have to do that because if you don't, it's going to be gone the next time someone reboots the machine. This is your class. Uh, it's not enough for me to cover the material if no one gets it or understands it, right? I could say, well, yeah, I, I covered if statements, but if no one got it, then I didn't really cover it very well. So therefore, ask questions that, that you need to ask. Um, to, to get the, the stuff done. Um, one of the things that I handle a little bit differently than a lot of instructors is late work. Um, I take a very loose attitude towards late work, late work compared to some of my uh, colleagues. You know, some of my colleagues, how they handle late work, there's no such thing as late work. If it's late, it doesn't count. That simple, right? And I think that's a little extreme. Uh, I recognize that you all likely have other responsibilities, other things going on in your life. And they're through no fault of your own. You could be ill. You could have to go out of town for an emergency or whatever. So I try to accommodate that. Now, here's the thing, though. If you're late with one assignment because you're ill or whatever, um, it's no big deal, right? You know. But a couple things. First of all, keep me in the loop. Now, you don't have to divulge any personal information if you don't want to. You know, if you had a family emergency and you really don't want to go into details, you don't have to go into details. Just say, I have a family emergency. I'm going to be out of town for a few days, and I expect to get the homework done such and such day. That's sufficient, all right, just to keep me in the loop. So I know that the assignment's important to you. It's not that you're just blowing it off, that there's a legit reason why you can't get it in on time. The other thing is to uh, be sure if you're not getting the assignments done on time because there's something you don't understand, be sure you're asking the questions. All right. Be sure you're not just struggling or flailing away trying to get the correct answer. You know, I've had students tell me, oh, I've spent 20 hours on this, 8 hours on this, whatever. And really, trying to figure out stuff on your own is a good quality. But getting to a point where you're spinning your wheels and not making any progress, you're just frustrating yourself. All right? If you need help, ask for it. 
I try to do my best maybe to not give you the answer, but maybe point you in the right direction where you can find the answer. That is sort of, as a teacher, that's sort of one of the neater things that you can do, you know, when you don't necessarily answer the question for them, but you help them discover the, you know, you help the student discover the, quest, the, the, the answer on their own. The point is, though, the bottom line, the too long didn't read uh, version of this is, I reserve the right to take up to 10% a day off for late assignments, but I will if I've been informed and people are asking questions and I understand where they are with the assignment, I also may not take points at all off if it's late. All right. The only thing I would say is if you're late on a few assignments, on, on maybe like one or two assignments, that may not be a big deal. If you continue to be late on the assignments, that's a sign that something needs to change. Maybe you need additional help and come see me during office hours or whatever. All right. So it's important that you know you don't use the, the my flexibility as a crutch for late assignments. You have an assignment pretty much every week for five points, a final that is worth 25 points, and that's your 100 points for this class, and then the standard 90, 80, 70, and so on. This is a schedule that we will be following. All right. Now, the course itself is divided into uh, a module for each week. All right, there's a couple of modules of introductory material that we'll, we'll talk about today. But essentially, you will see for every week a weekly module. That will include the assignment that's due, examples that I go over in class, and it will uh, include also uh, videos of uh, the, the classroom videos, the classroom lecture videos. So when I get and upload the lecture video today, you'll see 826 lecture here in this folder. Course information. Um, there's a link for, to the textbook site. This is a very important link, setting up your class, to uh, your computer to do the assignments. And there's a page in the book that covers that. I'll spend a little bit of time discussing that today in class. And finally, copyright information for educational projects. Uh, that's more important in the classes that like use images and multimedia, but it also is relevant here. You know, if we ever do something, you know, you're not allowed to take stuff from other sources without giving credit to those sources. What I do want to talk about, and this is something I'm doing different this semester. So some of you may have had me in previous semesters. Uh, this is like sort of uh, an experiment that I'm trying this semester. And that relates to how I'm going to grade your assignments. All right? This class meets Monday and Wednesday. All right? And we have lecture and lab on Monday and Wednesday. The labs will be due the Tuesday following the week that it was assigned. So, for example, lab one is assigned week one. So, lab one will be due Tuesday of week two. Now, I know we don't meet on Tuesday of week two or any week, but you can upload it to Canvas. There's a, a, a Dropbox that you can use to upload the assignments to Canvas. So you'll just go and upload them there, and it's due the Tuesday of the following week that it's assigned. So week one is due Tuesday of week two. Now. Wednesday, in lab of week two, I will spend grading your assignments. Now, there's only, I don't know, 12-ish people. Uh, I think that can easily be done in a lab period. If you turn it in early, bring it to my attention, and I'll grade it early. OK, so you don't have to wait until Wednesday. If, for example, well, it won't be that way next week, because next week there's no class on Monday. But if you were to finish a lab, let's say, on Monday, and you turn it in, 
bring it to my attention in lab and, and we'll, I'll grade it right then and there so you don't have to wait until Wednesday. But I'm going to spend Wednesdays uh, grading the uh, labs that were due the previous, the, the, the Tuesday, the day before. All right? And I'm doing that for a couple reasons. I'm doing that to, to help you and to help me. All right? Uh, probably one of my biggest challenges when I teach a lot of classes like I'm doing now is staying up on the grading. All right? And I have found that I've fallen way behind sometimes on grading. And that is very stressful and it's very tiring. And I'm hoping to get most of the grading done during the week. So the weekends I can relax and enjoy myself and recuperate from my schedule of the week. All right? And it's good for you too because I can give you more thorough, more accurate, and more timely feedback on it. When I'm grading stuff in the past, I've written comments about it. Sometimes my comments can be a little vague, you know, when you write them down. You think you're explaining them, but without writing paragraphs and paragraphs, I might not be clear exactly what the issue is. Whereas if I grade it right with you there, sitting with me, all right, there's so much better chance of us to be able to talk. And I'll say, well, uh, your if statement doesn't work for 40 hours, let's say. If an employee works 40 hours, and you'll say, what do you mean it doesn't work for 40 hours? And I'll say, well, see there, if, it, if it's 40 hours, it's supposed to go this way in the if statement, but it doesn't go this way on the if statement. And then we can talk about it, and you can get a, a better answer. So I am to give you more timely and more thorough feedback by grading it in class. So this is a little experiment I'm trying uh, this semester. All right? So when you get stuff done, if you get it done early, bring it to my attention, and I'll grade it. Otherwise, we'll figure on grading everything uh, the Wednesday of the week that something is due. All right. On to the material of the course. OK? And we're going to go over kind of the typical Hello World application that is usually like the first application you ever run in any programming language. Let me tell you a little bit about the way Java programs are work and the way Java programs are compiled and the way that Java programs run. And this points to some of the advantages of Java. All right? Sure. What time is lab doing from and what room is it? It is uh, 2 to 3 in uh, 202, I believe. I don't think it's well, let me, let, me, let me check real quick. It's right after this class. I, I know that. Let me. Actually, it, it, it is 2 to 3, but it's in BU 212. Yeah. So. Two to three in BU 212. All right. 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 Yeah, I don't I don't know how. I don't know how the schedule works or anything. All right. So here's sort of the anatomy of a Java program. Java is an object-oriented programming language. And you probably have at least had the intro to C sharp. So the term class and object probably has some meaning to you, all right? And hopefully this class will help sort of you to understand it on more detail. But all code for a Java program, if we're talking about a Java application, all of the code lives in a class file, all right? So all your code is going to be in a series of classes. 
Now, when we start out with the very first example we have, it's going to be real simple. It's going to be just one class. All right? As we get more and more involved, there's going to be multiple classes. All right? I think week two's assignment, there's going to be multiple classes in. So we don't, we don't stay in the land of one class for too long. All right? We're going to get into creating other classes uh, real quick. But all your code lives in a class. Um, in the code that you write in the Java programming language is called the source code. All right? And it will be contained in a file that has a .java extension, so .java. And the name of the file should be the name of the class. And the name of the class, the first letter should be capitalized. All right? Now, these don't necessarily seem like a big deal, uh, but it's rules that you should follow. All right? Don't give me... Um, classes that start with a lowercase or whatever. So if I had a program that I was going to call exam, for example, the soul, the job would be in a file exam dot java. All right. example.java, all right? That's in Java code, and it's human readable. Um, that means that anyone that understands the Java programming language can read it and understand it, and it makes sense. The computer doesn't directly execute Java source code. It needs to go through a process called compiling, all right? So... The problem means running the Java compiler, which is Java C. All right? That use a file that ends with a dot class extension. This is called source code. With only some exceptions, should be one source file per Java class. There are some exceptions, but for the first part of this semester, we're going to deal, just deal with one class per file. And that source code, and that is written in Java. This is compiled into what is called byte code, and it is machine readable, which means the machine can read it and execute it. The Java code is actually executed by a program called the Java Virtual Machine, JVM. So, if I'm going to run Java programs, but not write them, I only need the Java Virtual Machine. Let's say I'm never going to write a Java program in my life, but I'm going to run Java programs that other people write. I would only need the Java Virtual, virtual Machine. All right? If I want to create programs in Java, compile them, and run them, I need the JDK, which includes as part of it the Java Virtual Machine. This is important when you go to install Java. All right? You might think, I have Java already installed on my machine. I don't need to do that. If that's the case, you need to verify, do you have only the Java Virtual Machine, or do you have the JDK installed, Java develop, Development Kit? 
when you go to install it, you have to look and see which install program that you're going to create. Now, I believe Java is already installed on this machine, so I'm not going to go through the act of installing it, but I'm going to show you what that might look like. So if I type in install Java, We are on Windows, let's see, so. trying to show you here that you have to be careful that you are what you are installing okay this is installing and you can tell by the name of the file this is installing the Java Virtual Machine. Another name for the Java Virtual Machine is the JRE, or Java Runtime Engine. That's not the correct one to download and install. You do not want to install the JRE. You want to install the JDK, because the JDK gives you everything that you need to compile Java as well as run Java. So the JDK includes the JRE. So you want to make sure that you install the JDK. And if you're not sure which one it is, it should say somewhere on the page, or when I downloaded it right there, you can read the file name. It says JRE. So you don't want to install the JRE. You want to install the JDK. So, we could probably do a better job Googling then and say install Java JDK. And we see there it says Java JDK. Generally speaking, you want to pick the latest version of it available, Java SC, Standard Edition. That includes a JDK. So I can click that. And now notice that I am getting, eventually, A different file, the JDK. So you want to go and download and install the JDK. Another way to tell is the file size is a lot different. If you notice the JRE was only like one meg and it, took, it, it downloaded like in a second. This is like 150 megabytes. Okay, so you've downloaded the, the uh, JDK. 
you're going to want to go and install it. And installing it should be pretty straightforward. Double click it. It's already been installed, so it's not going to let me do it. But it'll take you through a series of steps. All right? Now, assuming that you are on Windows, all right, there's one more thing that you have to do, and that is you have to configure the path, all right, in order to run it. The path environment variable. So on Windows, if you say edit the entire uh, environment uh, variables, you can see that here. And you can see the path is here. Now the path is simply a list of folders that the Windows operating system looks for when it's looking for a program. So I'm going to compile a Java program in a minute. And I'm going to type in Java C. Now that Java C is somewhere on this machine, right? In order for Windows to find it, the directory where Java C lives has to be included in the path. And if I look here, this is the folder that the Java C, uh, uh, the, the Java C command uh, lives in. So you have to make sure that you go in and edit the environment variable for path and put the folder for the bin of the JDK. And it looks like, by default, it's going to be program files, Java, JDK, the version number, slash bin. But you have to make sure you get that correct. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to find it when you go to compile. It'll tell you that Java C is not a valid command. I'll try to simulate, uh, to simulate that in a second. Let me go in and just put some garbage here. So now my path is wrong. If I go in and try to compile a Java program now, it's going to give me an error. Not because I didn't even have Java installed, but because Windows doesn't know where to find it. So let's look, let's go and download the Hello World application. And we'll compile it and we'll run it. See why we'll see it not able to be compiled first because I've messed up the path. All right, here's a hello world. Ah. Let's go. Kind of Go make a folder called example. Let's go open up Notepad Plus. Let's post paste that in there, and let's save it at the class name .java. So the class name is hello world. We'll get to what this means in a minute here. But I'm going to go to save it. I'm going to save it in example. I'm going to call it the class files name hello world dot java. All right. It needs to end in .java. All right, so there it is in my example folder. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to try to compile it. Now remember, spoiler alert, 
I change the path. So it's going to give me an error when I try to compile it. So I'm going to go to do this. I'm going to go to command prompt. None to be afraid of in the command prompt. Make it big so we can read it. This is where you got CISS 125 shell commands. And if you don't remember those, good news is there's only a couple of you need to know. You need to just get into that directory. It put me in my default user directory. So I just need to go to the depth. How do you go down to a directory? You just type in cd desktop. Dot dot is to go up. So I'm in the desktop. And I'm into example. There I'm in the folder. So cd takes you down to a directory from another directory. Now how do I know I'm in the right directory? I can make sure I have the right files there, right? So if I type in dir, it shows me Yep, that's the code that I'm interested in. Hello world. So I'm in the right place. So now I'm going to try and compile this by typing in Java C and the name of the file I want to compile. And it'll give me this error. If you, if you see this error, one of two things happens. I've been teaching this class for I don't know how long, and I've only seen one or two things happen if you get this error. The one thing is that you have not installed the JDK. You've not installed the Java Standard Ed Edition. You've installed the Java Runtime instead. So make sure you've installed the JDK. If you know that you've installed the JDK and you still get this error, it's because your path is messed up. So you get that error, one of two things. You didn't install it. You didn't install the right version of it. That counts as one thing, <laughs> all right? Or your path is wrong. So now I'm going to go and put the path in correctly. And I'll go here and correct the path. Okay, I think I restart my command prompt. CD desktop, CD example, and I'll type in Java C star dot Java. Ah, that's better. It's thinking about it. What did it do? Didn't do anything. Well, this is one of those cases of no news being good news, right? If you didn't get an error message, that means that the compile went cleanly, that it went fine and it worked, right? Now, to verify that it worked, I can type in dir again and I'll notice that I now have two files. I have Hello world, which is the name of my class, dot Java, and hello world dot class, whereas dot class is the compiled version of it. And now I'm ready to run the hello world app. Okay? And I can do that by typing in Java and hello world. And there it goes. It simply outputs hello world. All right? Not very earth shattering. For the first lab today, Java should be installed up there, knock on wood. All right? I believe it's installed up in BU212. What I'd like to see you do between now and Wednesday is 
Be sure that you can do this in lab and be sure you can do this at home, all right, on whatever machine you're going to use if you're going to use a machine at home, whether you have a laptop or a desktop or whatever, all right. So try to make sure that you, that you can do this part. You shouldn't, have to, you shouldn't have to download or install Java upstairs. It should just work. So what did I do again? I went to the Hello World. I copied it. I put it in a file called Hello World.java. All right. I went and compiled it by typing in Java C space the name of the file. So Hello World.java. And then to run it, I typed in Java Hello World. I did take a little shortcut, if you noticed. Old habits die hard. I typed in Java C star dot Java. That would compile if there were a bunch of source files in there. You know you did it right if you have, after you're done compiling it, a class file in addition to the source file. Let's take a minute to look at the source file because you know, we're, we can't cover everything about Java, but can I, I can at least show you the way uh, that this Java class works. First of all, notice that everything from the slash star to the star slash is considered a comment. All right? Pretty standard stuff that, you know, if you work at an organization, sometimes the organization will have standards about what you put in comments. You can put comments anywhere you want to in your code to explain how, you know, why you're doing something, to explain what the, what the class's purpose is, to explain how to use the class, all kinds of things like that. A single line comment is simply two slashes. Should be no different than C sharp. All right. A class starts with a class declaration. And for now, our classes are going to be public. So we have the word public class, and then we have the name of the class. Now, Java is case sensitive, so if I were to make public with a capital P, it's not going to like it. All right? If I go do that, save it, and I call it, it tells me it doesn't know what that means. Now, remember that it's a computer program that's evaluating your code and telling you if you follow the rules correctly or not. It won't necessarily give you an error message as descriptively as you might like it. Like, I would like the error message to say something like, hey, dummy, the P in public should be lowercase, not uppercase. All right, but it doesn't. It tells me that it's expecting something and it's not getting it. And that's a little bit vague. Once you've gotten used to these Java errors and seen them, it will start to make sense to you. So essentially what that means is, hey, it doesn't really recognize that this is a class even though you typed it in. So again, check the spelling, check capitalization, that sort of thing. Notice how the braces are used to contain blocks of things together. So there is a brace that goes around all the code within a class. Remember, all our code is going to be within a class. We're not going to have any code that is not in a class. So when we declare our class, in this case we have a class called Hello World, the braces go around all the code. All right? Now, in this case, 
all the code is simply a single function. Every one of your Java programs has to have at least one class that has a main method. Main. All right? And the definition for the main method has to look like this. We'll go over what each of these mean next time. But for now, it's enough to memorize the main method for your program has to say public, static, void, main, and then in parentheses you have some string arguments. Last but not least, again we have a little comment here. This next line prints hello world to the terminal. And we have a statement to print to the terminal, and that statement is system out print ln hello world. Notice there's a semicolon after the line of code. If you don't have that, it's going to give you an error. Next time we'll look at more detail about exactly what all these things are and, and get into a little more involved first program. For today though, if you can simply go up in the lab, download this example, all right, copy and paste the code, put it in a file called hello world.java. Remember, the file name has to match this with a .java at the end. Then compile it by typing in java hello world.java and then run it. I'm sorry, typing in java c space hello world.java and then running it by saying java hello world. If you can do that uh, in lab, good job. All right. Your next step will be to try to get it installed on any other machines that you're going to work on, like at home, your laptop, or, or whatever. Any questions about this? Yes? Uh, it actually gives you a compile error. Okay. Yeah, like for example, just for the heck of it, I'll change this to just 1L and hello. It'll tell you, hello world is public, so it should be declared in a file name, hello world with 1L. And, the, and it's not. So yeah, it actually gives you an error. It's also, this is one thing that Windows is forgiving on, but like on the Linux operating system, it is not, or Unix operating system is not, is case sensitive. So it should be, all your classes should start with each word being capitalized. So hello world is capital H and capital W. And your file should be saved the same way, capital H, capital W. Windows will actually forgive you if you don't say, if you don't have the capitalization right. But actually, if I go to grade it on my Unix machine, it'll give me grief. So don't give me grief <laughs> is the bottom line. All right. Uh, any other questions? All right. Next time we'll look at this in more detail. And uh, we'll merrily proceed. All right, see you up in lab.